where are you now and how is the atmosphere? Uh, uh, my family and I left uh, Kyiv uh, on February 25th. We have a, a, a dacha, I guess you would call it, um, a summer home that's approximately 100 kilometers south of Kyiv. And we figured that that was probably a, a safer direction, certainly the north or east. Um, and uh, we did not want to go west because we don't have anybody really to go to. So we decided to go uh, south. Um, and we have now been joined by three other families. So our house is very, very full. <laughs> uh, we, have, we were lucky enough when we built the house 12 years ago that, um, that we built a basement. Um, it's a funny thing, but um, Ukraine has an awful lot of black earth. We call it Chornozem. And uh, in this particular part of the country, the black earth is two and a half meters deep, which means that in order to build a house, if you're going to build a house, you actually have to dig out to get to the clay level. So we've got a free basement. And at that time, we were thinking, what are we going to do with this basement? Well, it's turned out to be a very, a very good investment. Um, <clears throat> we're here. Uh, lots of people in the house. We are... Um, uh, we have found uh, yesterday there was a, 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 a danger of a, a paratrooper assault approximately four kilometers from here. Uh, I was extremely impressed and I, I, I would say just found it a fabulous and extraordinarily extraordinary event uh, to join the locals from the village, uh, each with high hunting rifles, some of them with pitchforks because they didn't have hunting rifles, others with just basically... Um, with uh, shovels, and um, they were going to go find paratroopers. Uh, this was, again, an example of civilian resistance. And the way that Ukraine has built that civilian resistance right now is just absolutely, I mean, it's amazing. Um, there, I, Putin believed that Ukraine and Russia were one people and that Ukrainians wanted to be under Russia. There is no possible way that he will ever occupy this country. Unfortunately, he may destroy much of this country, but um, occupying it is just not an option. Um, when we have 90% of the population rallying around Zelensky, where realize that a week ago, Zelensky's approval rating was about 25%. It's at like over 90% now simply because he's been doing what a president is supposed to do. He's been defending the country. Uh, but it's not just up to Zelensky. And I think that that's, that's the main thing that is coming out in the news. Zelensky is being made into a rock star. And that's important because he is the president. But this country is being defended by ordinary people. Um, and what I've witnessed over the last week has just been absolutely amazing. The level of mobilization, the level of, um, no one has to tell these people what to do. Uh, there's the, the analogy of a beehive. Uh, you know, if the Russian is a bear, we are bees. And he's putting his claws into our hive and wants to take our honey. And none of the bees are going to let him do anything with that. Uh, so yeah, Zelensky is the queen and that's fine. And we're going to protect the queen. But um, every bee out there seems to know exactly what to do and is unbelievably motivated. Uh, it's just, uh, we're going to be talking about national identity today, just generally identity. Um, identity is very often something that we talk about in books, in uh, literature, and we think about it in terms of history and in terms of culture and in terms of, of, of literature. Identity really matters when it's turned into action. And today we have literally the entire country mobilized because of the fact that it does, they do not want to be Russians. Simple. Uh, is, this, is this difficult for the people of Ukraine to, to stand up, to fight for your country? To, because it's not something that is typical for many other countries to do. Well, it's not typical. Of course, it's not typical. It's not typical for anybody. I mean, we can, we can talk about historical parallels to, you know, big revolts and wars and that sort of thing. But these were 300 years ago. You know, it was a different time frame. Um, 70 years ago, we had the Second World War. But again, this was, this was Germans coming into the country who were obviously different speaking. And, you know, they, they spoke a different language. They spoke... We've never had this kind of mobilization 
against an invader who basically, I mean, look, everyone in Ukraine understands Russian. The Russians don't understand Ukrainian because it is a different language. But everyone in Ukraine understands Russian. And so we are being effectively inv invaded by people who are very, very close. Now, if you want an analogy, I have been to, I've been to the Netherlands many times. I don't know of anyone in the Netherlands that does not speak English and very few that don't speak German. So if the English or the Germans decided to attack the Netherlands, it would be like in the Second World War, the Germans did. It would be someone very close someone who is, has a similar history, uh, close in terms of identity, close in terms of language, attacking you. And that is something that mobilizes people because um, I would say even, well, I think any invasion mobilizes people, but this in particular, because it's, it's interpreted as being very much a stab in the back. But it is a stab in the back that has also been happening for at least eight years now. How has yes. that? How has we've that changed? Had, we've had a war for the past eight years, and that's very important to understand. One of the reasons that um, perhaps the West was very surprised by the mobilization, and we were much less surprised, was because of the fact that Ukraine has been in a state of effective war for eight years. However, we have to realize that for my family, for example. We helped in the war effort. We've been very active. I've been doing writing. I wrote a book that has a chapter on the Donbass, but it was 600 kilometers away. And there was never really any danger to Kyiv, and certainly, definitely no danger to places like Lviv, Ternopil, Ivano Frankivsk, which were way, way, way in the West. And I teach sometimes, I teach as a guest lecturer, I teach at Ukrainian Catholic University in Lviv. And if in Kyiv we felt for the last eight years that the country is at war, it's a distant war, but it's our war. When you go to Lviv or when you went to Lviv, it was, it was very far away. People were sitting in cafes, people had their own businesses to run, people had their own issues. And yeah, the war, it was, Kind of like for Europeans, a war in Afghanistan or a war in Iraq. It was a very, very distant thing. Suddenly, this war has become very close. Suddenly, this war has come to ho come home. And I think that that's been really the, the, the major shift, that it's no longer something that's just on TV. It's no longer something that is um, takes up a lot of time for politicians to be negotiating peace and we will be wondering whether there'll be a some sort of a ceasefire or not a ceasefire and Minsk agreement, non-Minsk agreement, all of this, it's all gone. All of that discourse is now gone. And we have a country of 40 million people. Some have left, some have taken shelter, but the vast majority have mobilized for defense. And that is something that is really awe-inspiring. And are you Ukrainians themselves surprised by themselves or? <laughs> uh, you know, I think that Ukrainians are primarily surprised by the reaction of others as to what's going on here. Um, this, what we're seeing today is, I, I, I've, I've, I describe it as a national Maidan. Okay, so what I experienced, for example, during the Maidan protests eight years ago was a mobilization of Kyiv. And it was a mobilization of the... The, the, uh, we call it in Ukrainian svidomi, those that are politically active, if you like, or people that think about their civic responsibilities. Those people were very mobilized during the protests against Yanukovych. But it wasn't necessarily a national mobilization. It was something that touched maybe 20, maybe 30% of the country. Now it's touching everybody. And so this has become a national Maidan. Now, Ukrainians have done this before. We did it in 2014. We did it in 2004, we've done revolutions, we've done mobilizations. So to us, it's less of a surprise that we're capable of doing this. However, we are surprised and we're very pleasantly surprised by the massive amounts of support that suddenly Ukraine has been getting from the worldwide community. And um, it's been military aid, it's been diplomatic aid, it's been economic aid. The world clearly understands that today Ukraine, tomorrow Europe. 
uh, Putin must be stopped. And there's, this is not a local little Ukrainian-Russian war. This is about fundamental values for the European Union. This is about fundamental human values. Uh, big countries should not be attacking small countries. Uh, big powers should not be dictating to small powers how they should live. Individuals should have the freedom, and I'm not talking about countries now, individuals should have the freedom to work, live, speak, think, believe what they want to believe. That's the basis for a civilized, democratic, liberal society. Um, it's the basis for a free society. Ukraine today is fighting for freedom, not just our freedom, for everyone's freedom. Because if we fall, if we fail, and I'm, not, I'm sure that we won't fail, but if we fail, uh, everyone will fail. The world, the global community, the civilization that we have built will fail. And we cannot in the world allow that to happen. And I think that one of the, that is, that people in the West have realized that. And that's why we're very grateful for that support. So we're fully booked tonight in here, here in Amsterdam. Um, what would you like to add to this story or what would you like to share with our audience tonight? Well, I, I, we, what would I like to share with the audience tonight? We talked about, our purpose today was to talk a little bit about identity. Identity obviously becomes actualized in action. But there's a couple of concepts that are becoming very clear in this, uh, in this war. Ukraine is not only defending itself and defending European, if you like, civilization. It's actually adding to European civilization. We called our revolution four years ago the revolution of dignity. The concept of dignity in the Ukrainian idea is something that is fundamental to humanity, but it also has an interpretation which is very important in this war. Dignity is not just individual. Dignity is also collective. We as a nation have dignity and that dignity is worthy of respect. We're also fighting for a concept called fairness. I will not call it justice because justice is something very different. Justice is about laws. It's about what's written down. It's about agreements, including Budapest agreement, including other agreements that can be broken. It's about fairness, a feeling of what is right and what is wrong. And Ukrainians are fighting for what is right against something that is wrong. And that concept is fundamental that there is, a, there is an idea of right and wrong. And we may, in, I, I'm convinced that maybe in Europe, maybe in the West in general, in our sort of postmodern idea, we have lost the absolutes of right and wrong. We're saying that, well, everyone has their own right to their own opinion. Well, they don't, because their own right to their own opinion can lead to falsehoods. It can lead to death. It can lead to suffering, because opinions can be wrong. And Russia, specifically Mr. Putin, has been propagating opinions that are wrong, that are morally and, and, and not just morally, but factually wrong. So this war is about moving civilization, European civilization to the next step. Perhaps we are going to see it as a step in the development of civilization, of culture, of what it means to be European in terms of what do we really value? And I'm very proud of the fact that Ukraine today in its identity war has not only done something that the West and generally the world is admiring, but I'm convinced that we are also contributing intellectually, morally, philosophically, and with our actions to the development of what is Europe. Symbolically, today, we had a speech by the Ukrainian president in the European Parliament. And the European Parliament is moving towards accepting, finally, Ukraine into Europe. And I think that this is no longer an economic issue. This is no longer a political issue. This is a values issue. Ukraine has something to add to the European civilizational project. Uh, we're proving it on the battle lines. 
But after we're done with Putin, we will also prove it to you on the academic, intellectual, and I would say moral basis for what it means to be European.